Hello, I'm Joe Larkins. And I'm Natalie Chandler. Welcome to this edition of Your Family Pet. On tonight's show, we'll visit with man's best friend at work and give you timely information on keeping your pets flea and tick free. We'll explore the House of Muse, a most unusual cat rescue located in a storefront. And we'll dispel some myths about pit bulls. All this and much more on this edition of Your Family Pet. Production funding for Your Family Pet is made possible in part by Memphis Veterinary Specialists, a referral-based specialty hospital serving the needs of small animals, offering diagnostic tools and treatment options not typically found outside veterinary teaching hospitals, including orthopedic and neurologic surgery, oncology, dermatology, dentistry, ophthalmology, internal medicine, and more. And by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. What do Google, Amazon, and Ben and & Jerry's have in common? They all allow their employees to bring their pets to work. In fact, a recent survey found that about 20% of companies allow pets to accompany their owners in the workplace. Recently, I visited three businesses of different sizes who have literally let their offices go to the dogs. If you visit the Clifton Art Gallery, you'll meet the most famous dog on Broad Avenue. He even has his own t-shirt. His name is Argus, and you can't miss him. Tom Clifton has been bringing his dogs to work since he opened his gallery in the mid-80s. I realized long ago that I had so much guilt when I'd get home and leave again when my dogs weren't coming to work with me. I thought, well, I'll just bring it to work with me. And then when I am not there at night, then I don't feel guilty. And then, so it really started like that, but then I uh, found that I really enjoyed having the companionship and the clients developed a relationship with, with them. And Argus, I mean, he's such a behemoth that you know, you just don't miss him, and people really love coming in just to visit with him. As Argus weaves his way around and through the fragile glass and ceramic art that surrounds him, it brings to mind the inevitable bull in a china shop cliche. But Tom says that Argus makes the perfect art gallery dog. You know, dogs this size are very sedentary too, so they're not really active and jumping and anxious and energetic, so it's a, it's a perfect breed for for an art gallery. And he's just a part of the family. He's part of the Broad Avenue family. Everybody knows Argus. In downtown Memphis, you'll find the office of Poplar Financial, staffed with a half dozen or so employees, two dogs, and a cat. According to a Virginia Commonwealth University study, having pets at work can lower the levels of stress causing hormones in humans. I've been on the phone with call centers or not even people with computers for hours at a time and just sort of had to sit back and go, you know, I know that this rep or this system is just doing everything that it can to ruin my day, but there is a kitten playing with a rubber band under my desk. So it's gonna be a great day no matter what. But how do clients and visitors react to this office menagerie? Clients have just thought they were sweet and adorable. Um, our, our post woman actually always has a dog treat in her pocket. There's at least someone in the office all the time who's in a good mood. At Archer Malmo Advertising and Public Relations Agency, bringing your pet to work has been a habit for years. But it all started quite innocently. We started having Take Your Dog to Work Day in the late 1990s, and it just quickly became one of our favorite events. It, it was so much fun that, it, you know, people were like, can I bring my dog any day? And we said, sure, why not? The company has about 160 employees, and a lot of their furry friends accompany them to work. In fact, Archer Malmo has been recognized as one of the top pet-friendly companies in the nation. With so many animals in the workplace, you'd think there would be the inevitable behavior issues there really aren't issues. I mean, the dogs have to live by the same rules that the adults have to live by, so there's no biting, uh, adults or dogs. Uh, there's no barking, adults or dogs. Uh, there's no fighting, adults or dogs. 
Archer Malmo's product is creativity, and Russ Williams believes that having your pet by your side lowers the stress caused by an approaching deadline and increases your creative output. You know, we don't want to take ourselves too seriously. Um, we don't want to be too tense and anxious while we're doing creative work, and these guys help with that. You know, how can you feel stressed when you got a cute little puppy like this with you, right? Summertime means that our pets will be spending more time outdoors, and that exposes them to fleas and ticks. These nasty little bugs can make your pet miserable, can infest your home, and can give you a huge headache. Veterinarian Russ Drury joined me on our porch to tell us how to control these bothersome critters. Hi Russ, tell us about your friend. I brought Betty today. This is uh, my personal dog. Um, she came into our clinic with a Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. She was hit by a car, um, had a pretty significant nerve injury, so we had to take her leg off. But um, she has no problems getting around, trust me. She does, <laughs> she does really well. She's very cute. Yeah. Um, so with summer coming up, warm season, how do we keep her safe from fleas and ticks? Sure. I usually do recommend treating the yard. So they're usually going to be in the environment first, and that's where they're going to get them, or picking them up from another animal. Um, so I usually recommend treating the yard with something that's pretty safe for animals, uh, something with imidacloprid, and not a pyrethrin, which is toxic to cats. Um, those can be um, in a lawn spray or little sprinkle granules that you can uh, put around the, on the lawn. Um, and the other thing would be keeping them on a preventative year-round. You know, so if they're already on a preventative, if they go to the park, if they go to your friend's house, something like that, they're not going to pick up those fleas. Okay. And so if she does get fleas, how, how do we realize she has fleas? What do we need to check to see... Yeah. Sure. What are the indications? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, um, dogs are dogs are pretty easy because one of the main things we're going to see with the with the dog is uh, itching and scratching. Mm -hmm. um, with a cat, we don't usually see that. They usually don't get very um, itchy. They don't typically suffer from flea allergy dermatitis, but they can, uh, which is an allergy to the flea saliva. Um, but the best place to look for them would be right around the tail head. So. If you kind of lift up the hair right around the tail, um, typically you can see either fleas running around, you know, you can see them trying to scamper off, um, or you'll see what we call flea dirt, which okay. is essentially flea poop. Um, it's red in color. What I usually recommend owners do is uh, rub a little bit of that on a wet paper towel. If you see red streaks or kind of a, a reddish brown, burnt orange color, that's flea dirt. Um, so that's a positive indicator that fleas are there. Sometimes you can see flea eggs too. Uh, they sell very small comb, very fine tooth combs. You can brush through your dog, you can actually see either the dirt, the eggs, which are just little white clumps, um, or the adults themselves. Is the same go for cats? Same yeah. kind of indications? Exactly. So they're, they're, um, you're, you're not going to see nearly as much on a cat, though. They're, they're excellent groomers. Um, they're going to ingest the adults, which essentially can, can lead to tapeworms. Um, the, the, actually, the flea eggs, the fleas themselves carry the tapeworm eggs. So if a cat's grooming really well, you're not going to see, you're not going to really see many adults. You probably won't see a lot of dirt, and you probably won't see a lot of eggs. So cats can be harder to tell. That becomes really important when we talk about anemia. So that's when uh, uh, fleas can essentially drain a patient dry. You know, bigger issue in young puppies, um, some small breed dogs, but c cats are the, the biggest issue because they don't show uh, signs. You know, we're not going to see that the, the cat is oftentimes not itching, not scratching, um, but it can become very anemic. So a patient's uh, blood should usually be half red blood cells. I'll see patients come in, cats that the owners don't even realize, um, and they have 10% of their blood as red blood cells, which is very dangerous. Usually if we can get the fleas off um, and prevent the reinfestation, we're okay. But sometimes those cats do require blood transfusions, things like that. Okay, so if you do get fleas in your house, um, other than giving your pet the medicine, sure. what can you do around the house to kind of get rid of what might already be there? Sure. I think, like you said, the medication, the best thing to do is, is A, to get something on the animal first. Mm -hmm. But I think the best thing is to wash their bedding, um, get their bedding clean. Their, the, the larvae and pupae and eggs are in, are in the bedding. So if you can take care of that, that'll help. Um, around the house, if they're still going to be there, it's, a, it's impossible to completely rid all of those flea eggs, larvae, mm -hmm. and pupae from the house. So. Um, the best thing to do is keep them on preventative um, so when those adults emerge, they will hop on your dog and they will be killed because you're never going to get all of them in the environment. Okay, and what about ticks? Is that kind of the same way or? Ticks are a different story. Ticks have four larval stages. They can have up to, up to six depending on the tick. Um, they, they burrow in the ground at different larval stages, so as soon as that warm, um, warm weather hits, they're, they're there. They're there. They're not killed off by, by the, the winter, the winter uh, weather. Um, Ticks used to not be, you know, a lot of people say, you know, if it's a dog that only goes outside the potty in the grass, um, 
Um, if she's if she's mostly indoor, we you know you don't really need to prevention. But I really recommend it. I saw last year I saw five cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, can be a very deadly disease. There is a list of diseases that ticks can carry that are zoonotic too that we can get. Ticks, you know, dogs can bring ticks inside um, and attach to us and, and transmit Lyme, uh, Ehrlichia, anaplasmosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Babesio. So there's a long list of diseases that ticks can carry and they can be very deadly to your dog. Okay, and if Betty gets a tick, how do we remove the tick from her? A, you talked about looking for, for fleas. Ticks mm -hmm. love to get into the tightest little crevices. So they love to get into the, uh, the ears. They love to get um, under the arms, places that you're not really going to see. So check them very thoroughly if you, if you do see one or you've been out. Um, we're in places where there's lots of grasses and trees. Um, if you, it, when it comes to removing a tick, you want to get as close to the skin as possible. You want to get a tweezers and get right on that tick head. So you want to get very close to the skin and then remove just in a straight up motion. Um, they can, um, you can break them off where the head is actually still lodged and that can cause an infection. Can also allow for still transmission of the tick-borne disease. Those tick-borne diseases take about 24 to 72 hours to be transmitted. Um, so it's really important to get that tick off as soon as possible and to make sure you get the head of the tick as well. Well, we thank you and we thank Betty for coming on the show and telling us a lot about fleas and ticks. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. This pet tip comes to us from Sherry Henson and Norman Adcox of Memphis, Tennessee, who are parents to four lucky whippets, Lydia, Olive, Golda, and Turner. Norman and Sherry write, sometimes there is the occasional accident where one of the pups wets on the carpet or oriental rug. When that happens, Norman and Sherry head for the kitchen where they grab paper towels and salt. The first order of business is to blot up as much of the liquid as possible with the paper towels. Then, grab the container of salt and pour generously over the wet spot. Norman and Sherry suggest mounding the salt and say it's better to use too much than not enough. Norman and Sherry say they buy inexpensive containers of salt at their local discount store and keep plenty on hand just for this purpose. Next, place a colander or strainer upside down over the pile of salt to keep anyone from stepping in it while it does its work, which is at least 24 to 48 hours. Left undisturbed, the salt will draw the remaining moisture out of the carpet and the underlying pad. All that's left to do after the 24 to 48 hours has passed is to use a spatula to lift the salt, which is now in chunks, from the carpet and throw it into the trash. Grab the vacuum and sweep up the remaining salt crystals, and you'll find the carpet clean and dry with no stain. The modern Labrador has ancestors that trace back to a popular fishing and retrieving dog from Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. There are three colored varieties, yellow, chocolate, and black, with black being the most popular and chocolate running a close second. Their noses match the color of their hair with minimal fading. Black and yellow-haired labs have brown eyes, while the chocolate labs have either hazel or brown eyes. The Labrador is a devoted, obedient, and amiable dog known for being well-behaved with children as well as other dogs and pets. The Lab tends to be a calm house dog, a playful yard dog, and an intense field dog. They're eager to please their owners, enjoy learning, and excel in obedience. Labs are frequently trained to aid people as therapy dogs. And they make good hunting companions because their broad heads and strong jaws are ideal for carrying large game birds. Labradors require minimum grooming as their coat is resistant to soil and rubbish. A weekly combing is really all that's needed. Labs are a high energy breed and need to lead an active lifestyle. Their favorite activities include swimming and retrieving or fetching. They will easily retain unhealthy weight if they are allowed to live a sedentary lifestyle. And obesity is one of the most common health issues. A healthy lab will maintain a trim hourglass shape the average lab's lifespan is between 10 and 12 years. In the heart of the Cooper Young neighborhood, amid the restaurants and art galleries, is a most unusual storefront with several cats sitting in the picture windows. It's called the House of Muse, and it's an oasis of rescue for dozens of cats. Well, um, tell me how this all got started. I had been retired for about a year from my husband's and my business. We had a business in, and I was, wasn't doing anything except being at home, and I was kind of bored. And I went into a nursery, um, a nursery, a plant nursery, and there were animals everywhere. And 
they, uh, they had cats and dogs and pigs and ostriches running around and everything. And I just saw some sad things in, in the, one of the back sections of the nursery where kittens had holes in their eyes because the workers were putting seven dust in the cages. And it made me sad and I just snuck back in there maybe a day or so later and I just started cleaning up the cages and taking care of the animals that were in the cages, the cats mostly. And then they discovered me after about three days and I just asked if I could continue volunteering. How do you keep up with all these cats? How many do you have in here and how do you know their personalities? You seem to really know each one of them very well. Yeah, I think after 20 years, <laughs> a number of them have been here for quite a while because some are shyer than others. but. It's easy to keep up with them. Um, we try not to get more than, we've had as many as 170 in this store. In our other store, which was, just, was a lot larger than this, we had a lot less than this. But I don't want to be that high. I don't think it's good for the animals. I think it's difficult for people to get into the store when there's that many cats. And out of the 110 maybe that are in here, there are probably about 60, I want to say, that are loose. And so we want to make sure they don't go out the door. But we bring them in, and um, they go in a cage over here. When they first come in, we get all the work done and make sure they're tested for leukemia and AIDS, make sure that they're flea free, that they don't have ear mites, make sure that they're spayed and neutered. And they're usually in the cage for a while to get used to the environment and all the other smells in here of the other animals. And then we slowly move them down the cages to the lower level. And if they have a good personality, they are let out on the floor as long as uh, we have space for another one to be loose. Usually one gets adopted from the floor and then we let another one out. And if we can't do that, then they go over here to the multi-cages and get used to being with other multiple cats before they get out. And you mentioned how you do the levels until they get down on the mm -hmm. floor. Is that kind of how you socialize the cats so they get used to each other as well as people? Right. And sometimes it doesn't work because you just got to go by the cat's personality. But, I mean, we've released some that are very shy, that hide a lot, and they tend to be in the back room all the time. So we have to keep our eye on them. We, I'd rather not release the really shy ones because they stop eating. They go into liver failure. So we just have to keep our eye on them. We do have a lot of shy ones in the back room, older ones that hide out back there, but they are eating, so we're okay with that. But otherwise, the cat ends up back in a cage again. That's not good. So how do you pair the cat with the person when they come in wanting to adopt one? How do you really know how the personalities match? That's fun. Uh, first we let the person fill out an application and we get a background on what kind of animals they already have in their house, whether they have dogs or they have other cats. And we are interested in the personalities of those animals because you've got to find a complementary personality to go with those other animals as well as the person that wants the cat because if the person that wants the cat is really outgoing and doesn't like shy cats, that's not going to work. Um, that some people just don't want to take a shy cat home and work with it and help, help it develop and become more outgoing. So you have to look at all those things and ask the, the person that's wanting to adopt a lot of questions. And, um, and plus we get used to the cats after they've been here a while so we kind of know who they, what type of personality they'll get along with. If they've been loose and running around in here a lot, then for the most part they can get along with another cat. It's, just, it's the other cat that's in that person's house that we're worried about because they're going to be a little fearful. So we always try to tell people that when they take a cat home for the first time to keep them separated because for maybe about two weeks. And then when they come out of wherever the room is that the cat is staying, they'll have that smell on their clothes and their cat can get used to it that way. And then when they finally let them out, break out all the treats, the goodies, the temptation, the new, new toys for both of them, it kind of distracts the other cat. You have so many in here, and like I said, you know them all so well. Is it ever hard to let your favorites go? Yes, a lot of those favorites have gone to my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they keep coming in, more favorites. It's, I mean, we just had two that were adopted together, a huge orange Maine Coon, Pepito, and then a beautiful long-haired white cat named Sm Snowball, and they went to one of our volunteers, so I know they had a good home, but oh, I wanted them so bad because I love long-haired cats. But. Do you have any fundraising events that go on throughout the year to help support all these kitties you have here? Yes, we have our 5K Meowathon every year that's usually in November. And this will be our 12th year, I believe, that we've had it. Out of the 20 years, we've done it for the last 12 years. It's usually at Overton Park. I'm not sure where it's going to be this year because it's booked over there at Overton Park. But Well, thank you for letting us come and see all your cats and giving us some insight on what it takes to get this place running. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. In the last decade or so, pit bulls have gotten a bad reputation, in many cases because they were the breed of choice in illegal dog fighting contest. 
But that reputation is undeserved, according to Heather Sanders, a representative of Fur Kid Rescue. Natalie sat down to talk with her and met a pit bull named Kane. All right, Heather, thanks for coming on. Um, tell us about your friend. Thanks for having us. So this is Kane. Um, Kane is a 10-month-old uh, pit bull, a uh, pit bull mix, actually. And he has a, an interesting story. So Kane came from a shelter. He was picked up, confiscated at a month old. And um, he spent five months at the shelter. We got him out. He was six months old. Um, you know, being stuck in a, in a confined space for so long for a puppy it doesn't it doesn't really help them. Um, but luckily, he was played with a lot. He got a lot of you know some attention. <laughs> clearly, uh, he got a lot of good attention and socialization, which is key. And so he is now currently adopted by his foster family, and he he's living the, the good life. So, what you doing? <laughs> that's great. Um, so when you have a dog that's in a situation like that and you're going to foster it or adopt it, um, what are some steps you kind of need to take to make sure you're doing it the right way? Uh, you definitely want to uh, socialize your dog. You definitely want to have the dog um, come around the dog, be around the dog. Uh, if you have other dogs that are at home and you're looking to adopt a dog, see how that dog that you're wanting to adopt, see how that dog is with other dogs. Um, I, again, dogs that aren't very well socialized might not like being with other dogs. So that's going to be the key thing with socializing your personal pet. And then whenever you adopt it, you know, when you adopt a pet out, you definitely want to socialize that pet as well. So that way it gives them a better, a better chance when dogs are socialized. Okay. And um, with a dog like Kane, sometimes there's a stigma attached to that breed. Why is that? Um, Sadly, there is a stigma attached to, to the breed, um, and that's going to be, you definitely see a lot of people um, that are fighting these types of dogs, and so therefore people are associating that with all of these types of dogs, and it's, it's not fair, it really isn't fair, because clearly this one right here, he's a lover, <laughs> um, he just wants to be hugged on and loved on, uh, but people, they don't, they see a lot of negative things, and so they're, they're gonna kinda take that and run with it. And my suggestion to that is, is I suggest that they, you know, do some research, go go get it, you know, go look at some books. Um, another great thing that would help is to, there's a show, a documentary called Behind the Myth, or Beyond the Myth, rather, and um, it's a documentary on pit bulls, which pit bull is technically not a breed, but it's a type of dog. And, and that's got a lot of really great insight on these dogs. When you do have a pit bull or other types of dogs that are consider, considered bully breeds, um, why is it that when they show that aggression sometimes, where does that usually come from? Because I know not all dogs do that. It's, right. you know, it comes from a specific situation. Yeah, um, you, it's, it's hard to tell you because sometimes you don't know their background, like with, with Kane here. I was lucky enough to actually know his background. Some dogs you're not sure of their background, and then again, that's going to be the key thing of temperament testing them, um, seeing how social they are, and also you definitely want to make sure that you get a trainer that is certified, a certified trainer that can also assess the dog with you. Um, some dogs might have triggers. Some dogs. They might not like hats. Um, they might have had a bad experience with somebody that had a baseball hat. Something happened to them, so therefore they might associate hats as something negative. Um, but other than that, these dogs aren't, they don't, they're not born with the mentality of, oh, I want to fight and I want to be a bad dog. That's not, they're, they're, it's a learned, a learned thing. Um, just like Kane here, Kane, he's learned how to sit and shake. They have learned behavior. They're extremely smart dogs. So if you teach them how to do something, they're gonna do it. They don't know that it's good or bad. So it is possible that if you have a dog who's been through some sort of um, issues before to rehabilitate them and to being a social dog who can be around others and safe, they're not all lost causes. Right, they're not, they're not all lost causes. And, and again, I mean, it's, it's definitely, Kane is living proof here. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> he's, he's definitely living proof that, it, that they're not lost calls. Don't give up on them. Um, and it, it really, it hurts a lot of our feelings, um, those of us who love pit bulls, all the, the bullies. It hurts our feelings when they get discriminated against because it, in all actuality, it, it's a breed or a type of discrimination and it's not fair. <laughs> 
Well, thank you for coming on and bringing Kane, and we appreciate all that insight. Well, thank you so much again for having us, and uh, hopefully people will, will definitely see pit bulls in a completely different way. That's all for this edition of Your Family Pet. We'll be back in May with more stories about the animals that we love. So tune in next month for more of Your Family Pet. Production funding for Your Family Pet is made possible in part by Memphis Veterinary Specialists, a referral-based specialty hospital serving the needs of small animals, offering diagnostic tools and treatment options not typically found outside veterinary teaching hospitals, including orthopedic and neurologic surgery, oncology, dermatology, dentistry, ophthalmology, internal medicine, and more. And by viewers like you. Thank you.